state titles, captaining league teams, going to Hawaii and winning league matches. Paul was for 11 years the chair of the Blue Gray Blue, Tennis Tournament in Montgomery, a national collegiate fair. During that 11 years, Paul changed it from a men's only to a men's and ladies event where there are eight men's teams from different colleges and eight ladies teams, all of whom are housed in individual homes in the city of Montgomery. He created an endowment fund so that the history of the event would continue because of the money in the endowment fund. He created a hall of fame for the Blue Gray Invitational. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you all win. I tend to talk kind of loud, so give me the uh, handshake or something. If I get, uh, I can turn this microphone down. <laughs> uh, congratulations on your award, Jeff, and uh, to you, Lewis, and to JC and his family. Um, it's a great honor, and congratulations to all of you. And thank you, Boo, for putting this together. I know you had something to do with it, and great facility, and great staff, great food. By the way, am I the only one who couldn't taste or smell their food? <laughs> I'm not coming down with something. Did I just shake your hand? <laughs> uh, so uh, when Leah uh, found out that I was going to introduce her husband, Danny, tonight, she said, well, Paul, what do you want to say? I said, well, you know, these things, the way they go, Leah, I mean, I usually get up there and I'll say something, you know, great about your husband. I'll tell everybody what a great guy he is. And Leah said, oh. Well, I have a chance to offer a rebuttal. <laughs> and so, we, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you plenty of time to come up and do your rebuttal. You're a good friend. <laughs> but, um, you know, Eric, like Jeff said, I'm a tennis guy. People know I'm a big tennis guy. I get asked tennis questions a lot. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is like, what's wrong with American tennis I mean, in the men's side? You know, we haven't had a Grand Slam champion since uh, Andy Roddick 20-something years ago. And I always say the same thing, I don't know. I mean, I've got a lot of kids and they're working very hard, but my guess is that if we have another champion, he'll be the son of an immigrant, first generation immigrant. And I say that because that's what's happened in the past. Sampras, Chang, Agassi. You look at today's players. Uh, Tiapa, who's playing right now in the semifinals in Atlanta. Uh, Christy, uh, Nakashima, right up north, uh, Shapapola, and uh, Aliasin. So, you know, uh, I don't know why that is. My guess is that, you know, they've had a tougher lot. They see the struggle, their parents come over here, they don't know the language, they don't know the culture, they don't have a family support system, they have to work their butts off. And their kids pick up on that. And you know, our kids are maybe a little bit, little bit soft. But um, whatever the reason, it probably will be the son of an immigrant. And you, at this time, probably saying, well, you know, I thought you were here to introduce Danny. What's this got to do with Danny? Well, this is Danny's story. This is Danny's story, and it's a great story, and I look forward to telling it, and I think you're going to really enjoy hearing it. So we're going to start Danny's story. Uh, the same year Booze Club here was formed in 1959, and that's when, uh, back in Cuba, a guy named Manuel Leal was running a sugarcane factory that his family owned and doing quite well, upper middle class in Cuba. And then Fidel Castro took over from Batista. And he decided, you know what, Manuel, thank you for getting this uh, shirt paint factory up and running. You're out. It's mine now. And he picks the layout family out on the street. Shortly after that, uh, a movement starts where Castro is going to introduce all of the kids to communism, uh, either by indoctrinating them in Cuba or sending them to the Soviet <coughs> Union. So there's this big movement to get the kids out of Cuba. And Castro says, OK, well, I'll let you in this little <coughs> tiny window Get your kids out, 6 to 18, no parents, just the kids. So Manuel is trying desperately to get his young 15-year-old son, Jorge, out of the country. With great difficulty, uh, he does find a plane, sticks $20 in his pocket, sends him to uh, Austin, Texas, to live with his older brother, Manuel Jr., who's going to the University of Texas. And um, so here Manuel is trying to graduate uh, from Texas, and he's got to take care of his little brother, 
luckily he's got a good friend named Raphael Cruz who helps take care of little Jorge. Uh, Raphael Cruz, by the way, would end up going to get his brilliant taxes um, uh, and uh, going to get married and have a son named Ted who would go to Princeton, Harvard, uh, and then become a U.S. Senator and a presidential candidate. He was also the son of an immigrant. So uh, they worked harder. So, um, so Jorge, who is now calling himself George, Jorge George, you know, he wants to be more American and assimilate into the society. He goes to Nebraska, gets a math degree, moves to Chicago, gets married, and has a son named Danny. Now, Jorge, George now, he is um, a baseball player like a lot of kids in Cuba. And, but he picks up tennis, and he starts playing in his apartment complex with all his buddies, a little Danny. He sees them, he watches them, and so by age seven, Danny says, you know what, I think I'll give this game a go. So he finds a 7-Eleven right by his apartment complex that has a concrete, wall, you know, the type, center block wall in the back, asphalt, pavement, and he starts hitting on that wall every day. And occasionally, occasionally his, you know, he'll want to watch TV or something, and yeah, I may not practice today. His dad says, look, son, you don't want to practice today? You want to watch TV? That's fine. Just remember this. Somewhere in the world, there's a seven-year-old kid that's going to go hit on that wall today, and for the rest of your life, you will be behind him, because you will never get that day back. And that's a message that stuck with Danny, a lesson that stuck with Danny the rest of his life. So Danny, you know, he goes and he gets good at getting his wall, imagines he's the best seven-year-old player in the whole world. Nobody, because he never seen anybody else play. So um, he thinks he's the best seven-year-old player in the whole world. And so his daddy, you know, everybody's got to have a break. Right? Everybody's got to have a break. No matter what you do in his life, you've got to have a break. So Danny's first break is... His dad, George, says, you know what, my son likes tennis. I'm going to take some of my hard-earned money that I don't have much of, and I'm going to invest in his game. And he enters him into a junior program at Aurora um, uh, Country Club, just you know, about 30 minutes away from their apartment, uh, run by a guy named Jack Sharp. Now, Jack Sharp is running a program with 600 kids, 25 of them are nationally ranked. So this is a big deal for Dan. Now he's going to be surrounded by other kids that play tennis. So he does this for a while until he gets really serious about it. His dad says, okay, you know, you're really serious. I'm going to help you out a little bit more. So by age 10, Danny starts a daily routine. Now check this out. Daily routine. Goes to school, gets on a train after school, takes a 30-minute train ride down to Aurora, works his way to the tennis club, practices from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock every day. I'm not through. At 6 o'clock, the adults get off the work, and they take over the course until 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, they leave, and all the serious juniors who have stuck around, they practice from 10 o'clock to midnight, or 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Jack Sharp happens to live close to Danny's apartment, so he always gives him a ride home every night. Danny gets home, 1 o'clock in the morning, gets a bite to eat, takes a bath, goes to bed, goes to school, gets on the train, and he does it every day. And he does this for several years. An immigrant kid. They work hard. They're tough. So after several years of doing this, Danny gets really good. By 12, he's 38th in the country. By 14, he's 14th in the country. All his buddies at the, uh, at the, uh, the tennis club start to have uh, a contest about who can win the most trophies. It doesn't matter what tournament you win. Junior... Uh, local tournament, junior national tournament, doesn't matter. What matters is winning that trophy. And by um, 15, he's now in the 16s, he's number five in the country. Number five. Now, back down in Bradenton, Florida, there's a guy that's just opened a nascent tennis academy uh, by the name of Nick Voluntary. Maybe you've heard of Nick Voluntary. He happens to, um, at that time, have a really good tennis player in Jimmy Arias, who turns out to be uh, one of the earliest, uh, first-ranked, youngest guys in American history to be ranked top five in the world. He also has Aaron Pritchstein, and he's teaching these kids from all over the world. He gets a segment on 60 Minutes about what he's doing to train tennis players. Now, one of the students, Bobby Blair, happens to play in a national tournament and plays Danny, and Danny kicks his butt. So Danny, uh, Bobby Blair goes back to Brady from Florida and says, hey, this is kid, lay out, he's pretty good. Well, Nick's getting a tournament together, an international tournament, to compete with the Easter Bowl at this time. 
And so he's going to invite all the best juniors from around the world to come to Bradenton and play. And so Bobby Blair said, won't you invite the Lee Allen kid? So, okay, you know, let's see what he's got. So Danny goes to Bradenton, Florida, plays against the best juniors in the world, wins the tournament, beats everybody. So on the spot, Bala Terry, being a businessman, says, I see a star here. And he's, you know, he's not going to give a dollar away very easy, but on the spot, offers Danny a two-year scholarship, fully paid. I'll pay your books, tuition, your, you know, food, everything. You'll, I'll, I'll train you in tennis. Just come down here for two years. So that's the second break. Everybody's got to have a break. And that's Danny's big second break. So he moves to Brady to Florida. Now, Danny is playing with world-class players, Jimmy Arias. Aaron Kripstein, Chip Cooper, Kim Mayock, Yannick Noah. Every day, his game flourishes. He becomes the third ranked player in the country, only behind Rick Leach and Eric Kripstein, who have bad deals pro career, right? So when he's 16, 16, he enters a local tournament in Delray Beach. And it's a pro tournament. And so as, as many of you know, tennis people know, you've got to play if you're not a, a, you know, a big time player, you got to play in the qualifying round, the big tournament before the main draw, to get two or three spots in the main draw. Danny, 16 year old Toehead Danny, that's back when he had hair. <laughs> so here comes little Toehead Danny uh, uh, going over to Delray Beach, going through the pro the qualifying, makes it into the main draw. His first opponent in the main draw is a guy named Derek Carr. Now, Derek Carr is a 100th ranked player in the world. And um, he goes on to have a great pro career. Matter of fact, he ended up in, in Birmingham coaching uh, UAB for 30 something years, I believe. So Derek Carr, I mean, he ends up having victories over Tim Mayotte, Andre Agassi. I mean, he was a big time player. But that's not what he was famous for. What Derek Carr was famous for was Vetus Garolitis. Who remembers Vetus Garolitis? So at, at the US Open, Vetus Garolitis had just won his first round match. And so uh, at the press conference, and this is when uh, John McEnroe was the number one player in the world, Martina Navratilova was the number one player in the world for the women. And we're not too far removed from the battle of the sexes between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs. So Martina was so dominant, kind of like Serena was, that people started actually thinking that she could play on the men tour. So at the press conference, somebody asked her, Elias, hey, how do you think Navratilova could do against McEnroe? Well, now, this is before the time of political correctness. And Garolina said, what? He said, I will bet you $2 million that she can't compete against McEnroe. She couldn't even compete against the 100th ranked player in the world. Well, that's Derek Carr. So this big movement starts to have another battle of the sectors between Martina, I mean, Martina and Alcalova and Derek Carr. Already $2 million is bet on it. Now, back in Delray Beach, here's Toehead Danny, he's got to play this guy, Derek Carr. Nobody's ever heard of Derek Carr, but now he's a star. Everybody wants to say, who the hell is Derek Carr? So with all this hoop going on, Danny's got to play him, little 16-year-old Danny. Danny beats him, 6'1", 6'2". <laughs> then Danny moves on to compete in the tournament, and you know he finally makes it to a, uh, two or three rounds. Well, there's a lady of means uh, from Mobile that's watching this match. Her name is Nan Arendale. And she owns a, a tennis club back in Point Clear uh, near Mobile. And she says, Danny, man, I love to watch your game. You'll play like Max Lander. He says, funny you should say it. Max Lander's my idol. You know, that's what pattern I game after. You know, I want to be like Max. I want to play like him. I want to act like him. She said, well, let me tell you, we got this big tournament in Mobile on Labor Day, we invite all the best college players uh, in the country to come around. And uh, if you'll come, I'll pay all your expenses. You can stay with me. You know, maybe you can, you know, see how you can do it. You can get some of these good college players and meet some college coaches, maybe. So, you know, okay, I've got nothing to do, sure. So Danny goes um, to the Mobile Country Club, who incidentally had just hired this really cute young crow that all the women are swooning on. His name's Jeff Gray. He looks a lot like that guy. <laughs> Just a lot cuter. And you know, so here comes little Danny Toehead, uh, Danny, uh, to Mobile to play against all these best college players. Jeff, how did he do? He won the tournament. 
people like Dan Cassidy, Mark Long, or you know, all these great college players, they just went through them like butter. So Neil Gandy obviously is one of the most um, uh, highly sought after player in the country to go to college. So he signs on with Pepperdine and with the legendary Alan Fox, uh, gets to play with Brad Gilbert, two-time NCAA champion, Kelly Jones, all of these great players. Uh, turns pro and he's uh, and Danny makes it as a two-time NCAA champion, by the way, on teams that made it to the finals and the semifinals of the NCAA champion. Uh, in his third year, he gave it up to become a pro. All the other players were turning pro. He thought he was good enough, too. And he played the U.S. Open. He played the French Open, had a solid career, had wins over um, uh, Ilya Nastasi, uh, Derek Ristagno, Patrick McEnroe, a list of players that he beat. But eventually he decided, you know, hey, I want to get my college degree. He ends up back in um, Montgomery, Alabama, thanks to Boo Mason, actually, who told him that he could, uh, you know, still have eligibility in NAIA, not NCAA. So Danny comes back and takes a job at uh, Wind Lakes uh, as assistant pro. And then two weeks later, the head pro of Wind Lakes moves on to Clemson to be the head coach, and Danny is offered the job. And you know, you're going to give me a salary? And, you know, pay me money? Yeah, take it. So now Danny is the head pro of Wind Lakes, and we're so fortunate to have him there for so many years. AUM did eventually get Danny, 35 years old, 15 after, years after being in competition. He went back to AUM to play and get his degree there, and became once again an All-American, made it to the finals at NAIA, and is the only American all-American in AUM's history. So, oh, amazing. <laughs> so, uh, but all that's not what Danny's most proud of. I think what Danny's most proud of is being my doubles partner. <laughs> <laughs> I think Danny's most proud of, you know, just his lifetime of achievement from being an ambassador and a teacher of the game. And it's my pleasure to